pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another totally blind page 112 tag. I haven't done these, one of these for a while. This is an exchange with Anna Bailey Karras, who is uh, promising us all that a YouTube, BookTube channel is forthcoming. But in the meantime, she has two wonderful podcasts. One is called Books on the Go, and the other is called A Life Less Guilty. I think I've got that right. I didn't write it down. I'm doing. I'm filming this in a bit of a rush so I can go out for dinner later tonight with my new husband. But I might not get the end of this video filmed until I come home. Uh, from dinner, but I wanted to get the, the first chunk filmed. So, Anna Bailey Karras made her YouTube debut, as far as I'm aware, on my channel during my 1,000 subscribers celebratory camera flip thingamabob, and she was one of the first ones to submit a video. I'll put a link to that in the show notes to see how delightful she is. And she is going to do her version, her half of this collaboration on... I'm not sure. I think a life less guilty, but maybe the book's on the go. One of, or both, I don't know. Or maybe the, she'll film it as for her uh, her own booktube channel debut. I'm not sure, but she will be doing something on her side with, with the pages I sent her. So basically, the page 112 tag is based on a French literary prize where the judges create a short list based on reviewing page 112 only of all of the books on the long list with no title or author information, just page 112. I have adapted it into a tag, and one of the many versions of this tag is the collaborative, totally blind version. So Anna has sent me three pages. There's nothing here about the title or the author, and I've done the same for her. So I will read them to you, and then I will give you my reactions, and then I will rank them in terms of the ones I'm most likely to want to read, or the ones you couldn't pay me to read, and so on. And I will also admit that I have not pre-read these because I'm just having a busy weekend. I have scanned it for names that I needed to look up the pronunciation, that, but that's it. So, without further ado, book number one. June had complained that her lover found no time to come to Stanhope Gate. The first time he came again, they had not been together a quarter of an hour before, by one of those coincidences of which she was a mistress, Mrs. Septimus Small arrived. Thereon, Bossini rose and hid himself, according to previous arrangement, in the little study, to wait for her departure. "'My dear,' said Aunt Julie, "'how thin he is. I've often noticed it with engaged people, but you mustn't let it get worse. There's Barlow's e extract of veal. It did your Uncle Swithin a lot of good.' June, her little figure erect before the hearth, her small face quivering grimly, for she regarded her aunt's untimely visit in the light of a personal injury, replied with scorn. It's because he's busy. People who can do anything worth doing are never fat. Aunt Julie pouted. She herself had always been thin, but the only pleasure she derived from the fact was the opportunity of longing to be stouter. I don't think, she said mournfully, that you ought to let them call him the buccaneer. People might think it odd now that he's going to build a house for Soames. I do hope he will be careful. It's so important for him. Soames has such good taste. Taste, cried June, flaring up at once. I wouldn't give that for his taste or any of the family's. Mrs. Small was taken aback. Your Uncle Swithin, she said, always had beautiful taste. And Soames' little house is lovely. You don't mean to say you don't think so. Hmm, said June. That's only because Irene's there. Aunt Julie tried to say something pleasant. And how will dear Irene like living in the country? Jane gazed at her intently, with a look in her eyes as if her conscience had suddenly leapt up into them. It passed, and an even more intent look took its place, as if she had stared that conscience out of countenance. Okay, well, this sounds familiar. I don't think I've read it. We checked each other's good reads, so I don't think I read it, but Bosini and Soames and Mrs. Septimus Small, those character names sound like, I think this is a famous book, but I don't think I've read it. It sounds humorous. It sounds old, like reads as if it's 
70 or more years old, could be 100 years old, could be a 19th century, I don't think so. But Aunt Julie, who is Mrs. Septimus Small, she's saying how thin he is. So are, is there a, does June have a husband and a lover? Oh yeah, they're engaged. No, I think it's just, so Bosini, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correct, Bosini is her fiance, right? And that's who Aunt Julie thinks is too thin. And that back and forth is kind of humorous. It doesn't make me want to laugh, but it's obviously meant to be humorous. June has a real personality. I like her uh, vim and vigor, her temper flaring. Mm, I don't know what else to make of it. It doesn't really grab me, but it doesn't turn me off. I'd have to sort of compare it to the other two, I think. So let's go on to book number two. Maria went to the kitchen to get a knife, and Ramon, seated against a tree, started to sharpen the tips of the branch. Juan was busy with his boat. Then he got bored and went to see what his siblings were doing. Maria pushed him towards the water and said, Play by yourself and don't bug us. Standing, pouting, on the verge of tears, he watched Ramon peel the branch. His eyes were fixed on the knife blade, on the chips of grey bark falling to the ground, on the fresh and white wood. Maria yelled again, Go away! But he was transfixed and barely heard her. His boat, unattended, was calmly turning on a sparkling dark surface. Suddenly Ramon got up, put the branch to Wom's neck, and slowly made him step back. Throw him in the water, Maria said. Ramon kept pushing him back and Wom was frightened. His fists were closed tight. His neck stiffened between two prongs of the branch. At the edge of the pond, Ramon removed the branch from Wom's neck and went back to sharpening it. Wom wiped his wet skin and, keeping his hand on his neck, turned around. His ship was stuck in the mud. The doctor had said that Wom should be outdoors as much as possible. His schooling could wait. Whenever Senorita Rosa instructed the older siblings, Wom went to the gardens. He liked being there by himself. He always found new things. A flower he had never seen, a dead bee, the shiny path left by a snail's drool up a tree trunk. One day he went past the rusty aviary. Its door was hanging from a single hinge. Some time ago, Ramon and Maria had pulled the other hinges out in an attempt to lay the door flat on a ground. There was not a breath of wind. Okay, that one kind of ended in the middle of a scene. I would have loved to see what that uh, aviary uh, little thing was all about. But I really like this. I love the writing. It just has a really nice rhythm to it. It was really easy to read aloud, not having practiced at all. And the dynamic between the three siblings, Maria, Ramon, and Juan, is very intriguing. Feels very real and not particularly kind. And what's wrong with Wom that the doctor said he should be outdoors as much as possible and his schooling could wait? He sounds very, very young, like toddler or six years old or something. And his older, I presume they're both older siblings, Ramon and Maria are not very nice to him. But this really pulls me in. I like the writing. My favorite part is the shiny path left by a snail's drool up a tree trunk. That is gorgeous. Yeah, I have a really good feeling about this one. I want to know what's going on. I want to read more. And book number three. At first, the Sawyer hadn't wanted anything to do with the black child. His brother, a convict shepherd, had been speared to death by blacks in a raid on his outstation during the Black War. But in exchange for some seal skins, the captain wished to hurry back to the islands to collect more, the Sawyer finally agreed to take Masina through to Hobart Town. The Sawyer looked down at the small child and resolved she would be no more to him than a bag of chaff to be delivered. Though only a blue tattoo of her name remained on his shoulder, he had once had a daughter. He noticed a lump in the girl's smock, and dangling out below a button at waist level was a tail. He leaned down, tugged the tail as he might a door pull, and was surprised when two large and sleepy pink eyes 
and a damp nose poked out. With hands that were at once very large and very gentle, that seemed like a sea eagle's nest made of gnarled eucalypt branches, the sawyer picked up Masana. Holding the small weight and trust of the child in his grasp, he began to fear that hate was beyond him. She looked up at the sawyer's face. One of his eyes was dead and milky, and his hair reminded her of a mat of bleached she-oak needles. As he slowly swung her through the air, she felt safe with the old man. He sat her down on the seat board of his cart, and then, in spite of his promise to himself, he found a dirty rug on the tray and, and spread it over her knees. Garney, he said. Okay, well, I really like that one too, actually. Uh, historical novel, obviously. Is this America? I've never heard of anything called the capital B Black, capital W, War before. So maybe Caribbean? Uh, Hobart Town? I don't know that. I like it. It reminds me very much, but I know that it's not from the novel that was made a big splash. Was it last year or the year before about the uh, the news of the world that was called by Pauline... Ah, uh, Pauline. She's kind of Canadian, kind of American, but it was about the newsreader that was carrying the indigenous, the little indigenous girl back. No, the uh, the little white girl that had been uh, raised in captivity uh, uh, by some tribe, tribe by some indigenous tribes, and he was returning her to her birth family. It kind of reminds me of that, but it's not that. So this this is a little black girl. Yeah, it really pulled me in too. Uh, is it a little cat she's got? Masina has got under her smock? I guess it's a cat, eh? Or something like that. He began to fear that hate was beyond him. I like that. I don't know why he says Garney. Is that his name? He found a dirty rug on the tray and spread it over her knees. I think he wants her to put the cat down, or is it the, the rug to keep herself, to keep the little girl warm? I don't know. There's a lot uh, I don't know, but based on this one page, I like it. The writing doesn't grab me as much as book number two, so that means that book number two is my first choice, by, f and then very close second is book number three. So book number two is about the... Uh, the three children, siblings, with the Spanish-sounding names. It's obviously set somewhere in a Spanish-speaking country, with Senorita Rosa. I love the writing and the story. Book number three, the writing is fine, but it doesn't grab me. It doesn't uh, sing the way book number two does, but I really like book number three. Book number one, I, 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 if I, uh, I, I'm not turned off by it, but also I don't really care so much for it, so it would be a little bit of a distant number three. Okay, so now I'm either going to film the uh, finale where I go to the computer and check Anna's email to find out the titles and authors, or I will film that later tonight. All right, I've moved you over into my little office library where the echo is terrible, and let's check Anna's email. <coughs> Okay, very interesting. So there's one here I've read, and I know because she went, uh, Anna checked my Goodreads, but it's totally understandable why she missed this one. But book number one is The Man of Property by John, by John Galsworthy, which is book number one of the Foresight Saga. So the reason that she didn't find it on my Goodreads is because mine's indexed under the Foresight Saga, not by the title of the book one. And book number two, I'm familiar with the author, but... I'm pretty sure it's not this book by her that I have. It's The Broken Mirror by Mer Merce Rotorita, and she's a Catalan novelist. I have another of her books, but I don't have this one, I'm pretty sure. And that was my first choice. Oh, 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 oh. Now that's fascinating because I am quite certain that I did the book that I have which I'm going to find out for you in a minute, but I think I did a page 112 tag, 
with another of her books and I didn't care for it as much as I like this. So I'm going to find out if they're different translators. And book number three is Wanting by Richard Flanagan. I'm familiar with Richard Flanagan, but not this book. I'm obviously not terribly familiar with Richard Flanagan because I've just learned from what Anna has given me great little write-ups uh, that he was he's a, an Australian writer. I don't think I knew that. All right, so this is fascinating. So, in fact, my third pick is from the Foresight Saga, and that was a five-star read for me. But, yeah, it is it is written. It was written, I always, whenever I talk about the Foresight Saga on my channel, I always say, I think it was written in the 19-teens, but, good lord. It's time to double-check that. It was published as one set or under the series name, The Foresight Saga, in 1922, but the books were published between 1906 and 1921, so wasn't too far off. But yeah, I love the Foresight Saga, but you know, look, reading one page and I thought the names were Uncle Swithin. I think Uncle Swithin was the one who lived to be more than a hundred years old. And Julie, Bosini, yeah, no, these, these names, now it, it all comes back to me. I read this as an ebook. I think it was a free ebook from uh, iBooks and I I was uh, I read it on my little iPhone 4. And that's where I really got into ebooks. I read so many free 19th century and early 20th century novels for free on my little iPhone and loved it. I don't think my eyes could handle it now. Just to remember that that book number 1 was my third choice. My first choice is book number 2 and yes, the one that I have in my possession and did a page 112 tag t uh, on was her novel Death in Spring and this one's called The Broken Mirror so now I want to check the translators. Death in Spring's translator is Martha Tennant and The Broken Mirror has a different translator Joseph Miguel Sobrer so isn't that interesting because I remember thinking oh, I wasn't so crazy about the prose maybe my memory's wrong I'll have to go back and look at that tag Anna says that Gabriel Garcia Marquez learned Catalan so that he could read Rotorita. A Broken Mirror is a classic of Catalan literature, uh, tracing three generations of a burgeoning aristocratic family at the turn of the 19th century. Interesting. That's all I need to know. This, and actually it's interesting, turn of the 19th century. This read like a much more modern story to me. Why? Just the prose, I guess. That's very interesting. And book number three, Wanting, by Richard Flanagan. So yeah, I'm familiar with his Man Booker, was it international? Probably just Booker, prize winning, The Narrow Road to the Deep North. I've never read it. I've never read anything by him. This story, Wanting, Anna says, uh, mixes the story of Charles Dickens with the founding of Tasmania and the conflict between the English with its governor, Franklin, with their governor, Franklin, and the local Aboriginal people. That sounds... Now, didn't I say it didn't sound like an American story? So, Hobart Town, yeah, Australia. I wonder if Garney is... Australian English. Well, that was fascinating. So I want to, I've read Galsworthy and it was my third pick. <laughs> but I want to read uh, Rotorita. Maybe I want to read uh, The Broken Mirror more than I want to read Death in Spring. And the, the Richard Flanagan novel, Wanting, sounds pretty darn interesting too. So that was fabulous. So how about you? Which of these books would have been your first, second, or third pick? Have you read any of these? Would you like to do an exchange of page 112 pages with me if you're a booktuber or send me some if you're a, a subscriber? I would be interested in collaborating with you in the future. And thanks again, Anna. That was fabulous. Can't wait to see what you come up with on your podcast or your new channel or wherever you decide to put it. Thanks for watching.